Uh, Sheila, thank you. But in fact, I'm going to begin exactly with what I did not know about both Henry VII and Henry VIII. What I'm going to give you, partly provoked by this event, partly provoked by the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years, is my revision of my own book. I mean, one of the, th in other words, my book on the young Henry VIII, Henry Virtuous Prince. I think one of the things that it's most important for all authors, but particularly academic authors, to do is to recognize where they are wrong. And if only more people in public life would be prepared to do that, we would be very much better governed. And of course, similarly uh, in public life, the reason that a historian will admit that he or she is wrong generally is if the evidence proves the opposite. In other words, evidence. That's to say, to have evidence-based policy, uh, not uh, policy-based evidence, uh, which we have far too much of, but I'm not going to talk about global warming. Right, let's, uh, let's, let's begin with what I think we need for the big picture. Henry, of course, this is, again, it's difficult. Henry. The young Henry, uh, Henry Duke of York, then Henry Prince of Wales, the second son of Henry VII, is born in 1491. Uh, the account that I give of his upbringing in Virtuous Prince, uh, founded on sources which historians had, had used very little, is, I think, here right and important. And let's just get that out of the way first. What is very peculiar about Henry VIII in his upbringing from the age of zero to 13, he's essentially brought up in a female environment. This seems to me to be something of enormously important significance. If you look at his son, if you look at Edward, um, he is consciously separated from a female environment, the world of women, at the age of six and moved into a fundamentally masculine world. Henry is not. And I think that the, Henry's enormous neediness for women, remember the key to Henry's psychology, we tend to think of him as misogynistic, this preposterous phrase. May I remind you of the wonderful remark of Dr. Johnson that a second marriage, and I hope there are not too many in the room, is a triumph of hope over experience. So you've got to ask, what is a sixth marriage? Henry literally could not do without women. He is a serial monogamist. He loves, with the very obvious exception of Anne of Cleves, he loves all his wives, at least for the moment. And he is also the nicest husband until he cuts your head off. Um, he has, and, and being again very serious under the humor, he treats women with respect. You look at the behavior of Francis I of France to Queen Claude, who is of more royal blood than he is. He drags her into the hunting field within you know, a, month, a, a week or two of delivering in pregnancy. Henry behaves completely differently. So first, the first point to get in our minds is, I think really before he much encounters Marnie or indeed any other men, this profoundly female environment. Why? Because he's the second son. Arthur, the elder son, is sent off to, at a very, very young age, a few months old, is sent off to the Welsh marches to be brought up as future king in an entirely masculinized environment. Instead, Henry, as the second son, is kept at home uh, and receives his, 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 essentially brought up under the supervision of his mother. This again is following Yorkist precedent. Exactly the same division that happened with the two children of Edward IV, with Prince Edward, who becomes Edward V, sent off to Ludlow, and Richard, Duke of York, kept at home, where, of course, the comments on Richard, Duke of York, the show-off, clever little boy, uh, mocking his uncle and all the rest, are very similar to many of the kind, he's the second son, kinds of things that are said about Henry, but of course, Henry becomes, with Arthur's death, he becomes the first son. What's important now is to look at the very different environment that Henry experiences when he goes to his father's court. Henry is summoned to his father's court in 1504. 
Now, that is only five years before Henry VII dies. The idea of a second reign is one that Tudor historians are increasingly resorting to. Maybe that's a, a, an unfair word. For example, John Guy talks about the second reign of Queen Elizabeth in the 1590s, when at the end of a long reign, things are done differently. Remember, monarchs can change. And I would argue that Henry goes to his father's court at a moment of absolutely dramatic change in every single area that you can look at. The first is the famous business of Henry's education. Now, Henry, uh, I, I, uh, again, let's do a little plug for another book, uh, a collection of essays edited by my friend Ian Dale uh, on English monarchs. And needless to say, I wrote the one on Henry VIII. And it begins with uh, the phrase that Henry VIII is the first properly educated king in English history and the first king to be educated according to educational theorists. I then go on to say that proves the limits of education an educational theory. Right. Now, there are two dominant educational theorists uh, in the world of the Renaissance, and Henry astonishingly meets both of them. One of the things we again need completely to revise is our picture of Henry VII. Henry VII is probably the most cosmopolitan of English kings. His first language is French. He spends vastly more of his youth in France uh, than he does in England. Uh, he does have English, um, uh, but it's probably, it, to begin with, I'm sure, is as, a second lang is, is as a second language. He clearly is comfortable uh, in Italian, probably in Spanish, in Latin, and so on. Uh, but his, his cultural range, which is astonishing. But what is very remarkable is that there's a distinct shift around 1504. Before 1504, that's to say from 1485 to 1504, most of the intellectuals at Henry's court are very second-rate Frenchmen. And a second-rate Frenchman is very, very second-rate indeed. Um, they are <laughs> they're, they're, they're dreadful, dreadful people like Bernard André and all the rest of it. In round about 1504, there is a dramatic shift towards Italians, towards the absolute top cutting edge of the Renaissance and to, again, although he's, he's in England earlier, uh, uh, really becomes a very dominant presence from 1504, Erasmus himself. There's also a very remarkable pattern of major continental visitors in this last part of the reign. So Henry actually, Henry as prince, encounters Claude de Cécile, who is the leading propagandist of the French monarchy. He also encounters the greatest theorist of the whole Renaissance, the man who reinvents the idea of the courtier, this world that we're trying to recreate, Baldassare Castiglione himself, who comes to England to receive on behalf of his master, the Duke of Urbino, to receive the Order of the Garter as, as proxy, is received with great honor, is presented with the chain of SS and all the rest, of it, and actually in England delivers a lecture which becomes the basis of the book of the courtier. Now, what I want to look at quickly is what is true about what Erasmus wants to do with education, because Henry gets that, and what Castiglione wants to do with education. Then we've got to go on, it's an awful lot to fit in the time, we've got to go on and talk about foreign policy, and we've got to talk about religious policy, because all of these change quite sharply in this last five years. Oh, and financial policy, you mustn't forget that. Henry is famous, famous for counting the pennies, or millions of them, because he goes into the hundreds of thousands. Um, so we've, we've got to cover those. But let's just begin with this point about education, because it's so important in the life of the young, and in the life of the young Henry. Both Erasmus and Castiglione draw on a single body of the ancient world. When we talk about the Renaissance, right, look at this house. When you look at it to begin with, you think it's just any old, though very fine, uh, Tudor building. If you look at it more closely, you will see that the detail is Renaissance. The detail is copied from Italian textbooks and whatever. Alleged, I, I learned, I did not know this, apparently uh, from, from, from uh, things that have been discovered in what's again, just been rediscovered, reopened the, the, the golden house, the, the actual imperial palace of Nero, the type of decorations there. So you have here Italy coming directly 
to Essex. Uh, that sounds exciting, doesn't it? Uh, Italy coming directly to Essex as it came directly to the court of Henry VII. But of course it came also not simply in terms of visual ornament, not simply in terms of sculpture, of painting, of music, and so on. Henry has famous uh, uh, Venetian organist, Dionysius Memo, and whatever. It comes in terms of the ideas but it's the ideas of ancient Italy, of the Roman world, above all, the ideas of rhetoric, the idea of what I'm doing now, which is the idea of persuasive speech, the ability to address an audience extempore, to inform them and to move them. This is part of what I'm doing with you now, is educational. In the Roman context, it's because of the politics of debate because of politics of persuasion, because of a politics of state service. And the, this perfection of language, which they thought reached its height in the works of Cicero, is what underpins Castiglione on the one hand and Erasmus on the other. But they want to do something very, very, very different with it. Erasmus wants to use this persuasive, fluent language, Latin, um, essentially as part of a process of Christian reform. Christianity begins as a religion of the spoken word. It's the religion of persuasion, of Christ the rhetorician, persuading people to, I mean, why the Bible is an extraordinary series of vivid stories. And what Erasmus wants to do is to revive that sense of the liveliness, the vigor, the immediacy of the gospel. Also, to go back to another idea, the idea of actually going, that we, we think that, that change comes from going forward. They thought that change came from going backwards, of restoring ancient virtue which had been lost with the degeneracy of times. They don't believe in progress. And we've got very good reason to stop doing, but that's a, a very, another and very much longer lecture. So that's the Erasmian context. And the key thing to understand about it is, of course, that center to it is the idea of peace, the, center, the central message of Christ. So this has been one of the great difficulties, isn't it? The first king to experience this, well, first of all, he learns jolly good Latin. Um, and if he hadn't had that good Latin, we couldn't have had the divorce because Henry basically does much of his own homework. He reads the religious texts, which enable him to construct the arguments for the divorce or whatever. So his education clearly plays an extraordinarily important part in that. And by the way, it's not just the divorce that Henry uh, uses his Latin for. In the first half of his reign, remember, Henry's reign divides around the 1st of January, 1527. There's been a nonsense argument put forward uh, uh, by, by somebody who really should know better that the reign of Henry VIII divides in 1536 when he receives a blow to the head. And we're very fond of medicalized arguments. And after he's received the blow to the head, he becomes terribly nasty, having been nice before. There's a very simple chronological problem with this. The year before he gets the blow on the head, he commits the two most shameful executions general opinion, shameful executions of the reign, Thomas More and John Fisher. That's without the blow to the head. But after the divorce crisis, Henry changes because of the divorce. He has the worst possible divorce. Seven years to get it, right? Just think what that means. So, but the, the first Henry uses his learning in the first half of his reign passionately to defend the papacy. And he used the papacy in, in war. He fights his first war in favor of the French, in 15, uh, sorry, in, in favor of the papacy in 1513. We've got the, that first French war completely wrong. The people who argue for it are the leaders of the church. Henry's war against France is a crusade because you wouldn't believe it that, that Louis XII of France had done something completely unheard of. He got divorced. He reached absolutely shocking, and he'd remarried. Um, he'd also uh, repudiated the Pope uh, and, and summoned a rival council. So Henry begins his first French war as a papal crusader, the English fight under the actual cross keys of the Pope. In the, and Henry uses his learning for that, and he uses his learning again more famously, of course, uh, in, in, 15, uh, in the wake of Martin Luther, 1520, 1521, uh, with the composition of the assertion of the seven sacraments uh, to defend the Pope against the attack of Martin Luther and also to gain himself, to earn himself the famous title uh, of um, 
the defender of the faith. Now, that's a product of that Erasmian learning. So what we've already learned, that Erasmian learning, can both support the church and attack the church, right? It's ambiguous. But the most important thing is, where does the idea of the peace as being dominant in, uh, in Erasmian theory, where does it fit in with Henry? And here again, I think we've simply got to start again. There's been an enormous amount of nonsense written about movements for peace uh, in the early 16th century. They are as fictitious as, you, as uh, movements for international unity in the 20th and 21st. They are mere words and mere word spinning, I'm afraid, which are used to cover uh, much more uh, unpleasant motives uh, by much more unpleasant people. Because again, what we need to do is to recognize that the real influence on it, I mean, he, he, Erasmus supplies the technical side of Henry's education in terms of Latin. The actually word I, ideology, the ideas that, that shape Henry's education are the work of Castiglione. And if you look at, uh, and I would recommend the, the book of the courtier is one of those things that takes you into the mind of this period almost more clearly than anything else. And what is at the heart of the argument there is how how do you become a gentleman? The kind of people who've owned houses like this right across uh, our history from, from the period we're talking about now. And the idea is, you it's really very much the, idea, the best of the idea of the public school which derives from it, which is um, a healthy mind in a healthy body. The idea that you require both learning and that you require physical courage and sport. So it's scholarship and sport. It's a scholar and gentleman. It's that idea. And Henry embodies that. So I think the notion which, again, when I, when I, when I wrote my, 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 my the, the, the a, a virtuous prince, that there's something surprising about the young Henry being taught jousting, sort of under the eyes of his father, that we tend to think of his father as being pacific and being opposed to that sort of thing. All of that is nonsense. It's wrong. And what is striking is that it's only after the visit of Castiglione that the young Henry actually is publicly taught the art of jousting. He's never allowed to joust under his father. He's only allowed to ride at the ring, and it takes a act, major act of breaking the rules at the start of his own reign, because jousting is so dangerous and when, when there isn't another heir. So we need to then to see Henry as having been brought up with war as an ideal. I think there can be no doubt about this. The second thing I would want to argue for in terms of the great change in policy uh, in this, this second part of his father's reign, uh, the, 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 the period from 1504 onwards, there is a very sharp change of foreign policy. Up to that point, broadly speaking, Henry VII is in favor of pretty much peace with everybody, but especially peace with the hereditary enemy, France. And you do a deal with France by which the king is paid what the English call tribute and the French call a pension. That's to say he's bought off. Um, but also, what's very important to understand, Henry VII deliberately connives at a very large part of his councillors receiving very large bribes from the French as well because this entrenches what had been a very... Remember, we find this difficult to understand. We assume that the natural policy is peace. This is wrong. The natural policy for vir virtually all recorded time up to now is war. And the essential machinery of the English state is designed for war. Parliament comes into being essentially to produce war taxation. That's what it's there for. And the English state finds it extremely difficult to work in times of peace. Very, very difficult to work. But one of the reasons that Henry VII, who uh, in the earlier stages of his reign has got neither the political nor the financial strength to wage war, actually has to have a kind of semi, we, police state's the wrong word, but to use, to use his following, to use his retainers, to use, remember, Henry VII does not abolish bastard feudalism retainers. He makes himself the biggest bastard feudal lord of them all. That's the right way of looking at it. He, he monopolizes that force as far as he possibly can and shapes it and directs it to his own purposes. But from 1504 onwards, Henry changes policy very sharply. And this again is in 
response to the changes in Europe. We again, we've written far too much of our history hermetically sealed from what's going on across the channel. There, is, there are huge dramatic changes in continental Europe in this period. The first is following the defeat of the English uh, in the Hundred Years' War, the astonishing process of the reconsolidation of France. But also under, under Louis XII, that's Henry VII's contemporary king of France, the, the consolidation of France as a trans-alpine power as well. France taking over northern Italy and aspire, uh, be, around the Duchy of Milan and also aspiring to take over the Kingdom of Naples. Uh, and the, 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 this, the, this direction of French policy is, uh, is intensified because Louis XII has got no heir. In French law, a woman can not inherit the throne. He had a daughter uh, with his wife and Anne Duchess, uh, the second wife, that's to say, with, with, with Anne Duchess of Brittany, who was the heir of Brittany and the heir of his clay and the heiress of his claims in Italy. Right? So she's a vast, vast heiress. And the, the, the key issue is: will she be married to another prince, a foreign prince, i.e., dividing? this united France, or will she be married to the, under Salic law, the heir to the French throne, who is François Duc d'Angoulême? And it is settled in this period that she will be married internally in France. So, of course, you then, the, the, this enormous consolidated block emerges at the, at the heart of Europe. You know, the thing that English policy virtually right through has been designed to avoid, you have this consolidated block. How does Henry, this, that's why Claude de Cécelle comes to England to explain this and to justify it and to give in fact the first biography of Louis XII, bizarrely, at the court of, at the court of Henry VII. Why, uh, wh what is the way that you can counter it? Well, there's an, the creation of, the a, a glimmer in an eye of the creation of another new great international block, which is the House of Habsburg. And what I would argue, from 1504, there's this astonishing shift of English policy to the consolidation of the House of Habsburg to build it consciously to building up what would be this gigantic conglomeration of the Holy Roman Empire, the vast claims in Italy, including a rival claim to Milan, of the Netherlands, uh, that's to say both Belgium uh, and be both be what we call Belgium, what we call the Nether, what we call Holland, uh, and, and uh, down as far as Luxembourg, and Spain and the New World. And Henry VII, I think, consciously sets himself, A, to ally England with the Habsburgs, and B, to finance them, which brings us very neatly to the question of the financial world that Henry VII uh, 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 shifts very sharp. Uh, he'd always been tight with money and effective at raising it, but there's a dramatic cranking up of financial policy in 1504, which is associated particularly with the appointment of Edmund Dudley as, as, a, as, as, a, as a pay, very unusually, the brilliant lawyer we were hearing about him uh, from Stephen this morning, uh, brilliant lawyer, wildly brilliant lawyer, uh, who is recruited uh, to run uh, effectively a revenue raising court, which is designed to put the legal screws on people so they cough up money to the king as quickly as possible. What much of a, most of us are not familiar with is that between two thirds and three quarters goes in cash to the Habsburgs. Sums like £108,000. That entire royal revenue, in theory, in cash, loaded in chests, in silver pennies, are given to the Habsburgs as part of this extraordinary process of reorientation. And the reorientation culminates in when, when, when the Archduke Philip, whose trip to Spain has been financed by this vast sum of money, um, is shipwrecked in England uh, as a result of a storm. A great, he was stupid enough to set sail you know, in early January in the Channel. So, you know, a bit like a silly, um, you know, silly, silly refugee smugglers. And he's, 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 he's cast ashore uh, at Falmouth and all the rest of it becomes effectively prisoner of Henry VII and there's a whole series of, of extraordinary prisoner swaps, the, the, the last surviving claimant, uh, last surviving real Yorkist claimant or virtually the last to the English throne the, uh, the Earl of Suffolk is, is designated for handover uh, you sign the Malus Intercursus a, a trade and, uh, a, a, and whatever alliance and Literally at this, it's a summit conference at Windsor, and there are three people present, the Duke, the Archduke, 
Henry VII and the Prince of Wales, who is consciously involved in this process and is absolutely central and part of it. And it seems to me, therefore, that rather than seeing what we've tended to do, isn't it? We've tended to see the young Henry with his jousting and his war and whatever as reacting against his father. I do not see this as being the case at all. I think there's a direct continuation of policy across the two reigns. It seems to me to be evident that this is the case, and it's the only way that one can explain it. Now, it was clear that that policy, that swing to the Habsburgs and that swing to war from the long period of France, uh, 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 of peace with France, it was profoundly controversial. It was opposed, of course, by virtually every councillor who was being subsidised by the French. You know, significant parts of their income were coming over in nice French uh, um, uh, 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 écu, écu de soleil or whatever it was, you know, newly minted and handed over um, at um, uh, at Lady Day and 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 uh, and uh, at Michaelmas, so they got very used to it. So there is resistance, but that resistance, as I said, is broken by the bishops on the king and the bishops on Henry VIII's council. So there is a remarkable shift of policy of which the young prince is, I think, a central part. The uh, his training, his public training in the joust, his rejoicing in the arts of war, his determination to fight the French, which again is expressed virtually on the first day of his reign. I do not think that these things were, as it were, undesigned by his father, and I don't think that they were rebellions against him. That seems to me to be very, very important. The second thing that I think we need to understand, the, 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 the other great area uh, is actually the area of religion and of religious policy. I've emphasized very much that 1504 sees a change intellectually in which you shift from second-rate Frenchmen to first-rate Italians, including, incidentally, the man who documents most of this, um, who um, uh, is, is a man called Polydor Virgil, who becomes the official historian, replacing the hopeless Bernard André, and is the recorder of all of this, and particularly the recorder uh, of, of the extraordinary events of the very last phase of Henry VII's reign, the beginning of Henry VIII, uh, particularly the attack and fall of Empson and Dudley, uh, which I, I think I can show was written originally as a completely separate section of his history, which is actually slotted into, uh, into a pre-written text and so on. Um, Polydor Virgil, uh, again, documenting all this for us. But there's also a dramatic change, I think, in the king's character. And I think we, again, need to understand, and it's something that, that is that, that is true of this whole period, the profound tension, which again is part of Erasmus, and the profound tension which is expressed architecturally, all of these buildings, you know, you've got a hall and you've got a chapel. What on earth is the relationship between the pomposity of these buildings, the extravagance, the splendor, the gold, the silk, the velvet, the thread and all the rest, and the religion of Christ? This extraordinary tension that runs through the period. And the tension, I think, cuts absolutely through the heart uh, of Henry VII. And then it's exactly in this period that you get two totally contradictory things. On the one hand, you get what I describe as the king cranking up the most vicious aspects of his financial policy, largely, I think, to finance this huge diplomatic shift. The second thing is, on the other hand, in complete contradiction with that, you have his manifest torments of conscience. And they happen again at exactly this moment that the young king is summoned to court. So he finds a father very, very different from what we think. Two sets of negotiations are going on in Rome uh, in 1504, uh, culminating in, in July uh, of 1504. One we all know about, it's to get Henry, uh, 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 that's Prince Henry, a dispensation so that he could marry the widow uh, uh, of Prince Arthur. He could marry his brother's widow uh, with, with all the consequences that we know flows from that. But the thing that Rome, the new pope, Julius II, regarded as seriously controversial was something very different. Henry was in agony about his relations with his father confessor. 
We forget this. If you look at the history of France or the history of Spain, the role of royal confessors is absolutely central. These are the people you know, who, in the Catholic Church, manage the king's soul. Often they are, become leading ministers, or they become the eminence grise figure against, you know, uh, 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 in parallel with the Cardinal Woolsey. We've forgotten they can exercise exactly the same power in England. And this is a reign, again, of two people whose roles, one of them is very well known, but his role is too often forgotten, and that is John Fisher, who is Cardinal, uh, who is confessor uh, to Lady Margaret Beaufort, to Henry VII's mother, and the other is the king's last confessor, a man, again, French, like so many of those who surround him, Etienne Baron, known usually as Stefanos Baronos, um, who becomes the king's confessor. And to the license which enables Henry VII to appoint his confessor is, again, this subject of intense negotiation uh, with the Pope. And interestingly, how all of these things fit together, that's the reason that Castiglione comes to England. Because the Pope says, it's absolutely impossible that I give you the license to appoint your own your confessor just because you want to change one. And, uh, but he says, by the way, uh, would it be possible for my nephew, the Duke of Urbino, to be made a Knight of the Garter? To which the King's envoy, Cardinal Adrian, responds, totally impossible. It's, you know, everybody in Europe competes to be made a Knight of the Garter. So the two of them sort of sit down and have a chin wag and they decide two impossibles makes one possible. You know, uh, uh, so Henry Henry gets the license for his confessor and the papal nephew gets the garter and Castiglione comes to England. So what you've got to do, you have to imagine a situation in which there is a move on the one hand to a collection of self-consciously pious, improving religious figures who are in many ways, very dubious about royal policy. And they include not simply, uh, not simply John Fisher, who's given the very junior bishopric uh, of uh, the very junior bishopric of Rochester. They include the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Chancellor himself, who at the beginning of the parliament, this is an astonishing thing, at the beginning of the parliament of 1504, the last parliament of Henry's reign, actually preaches a sermon on the nature of justice and argues that the greatest injustice is when justice is perverted for the wrong ends, which is exactly, of course, what the king is doing. So we have to see, I think, profound tensions within the royal council and within the royal court. Uh, and of course, those tensions mediated around the king's mother, around Lady Margaret Beaufort, and them boiling up round Henry's own accession when the, when, the, when the position of Henry VII is removed. And it seems to me that without this sense of he's brought up to practice war as well as peace, to practice the arts of learning, yes, but more particularly the arts of chivalry, that he's brought up with a view that there will be war and that there will be traditional war against the French. He's also brought up in a, in a consciously, I think, reforming Catholicism and is very much part of that and is devoted to those involved with it. Again, we've got a terrible problem because we understand Henry backwards. We know he repudiates the Pope. We know he cuts the head off of Thomas, Thomas More and, and of John Fisher. We've got to forget that. At the beginning of Henry's reign, there is not a trace of this. Any attempt at seeing consistency in Henry's religious policy, in seeing a general tendency to uh, sort of neo-Protestant reform or whatever it be, simply seems to me to be nonsense. Henry begins as the most serious, um, uh, not, not, I think, in the sense as, as much of his father. Uh, there's no evidence of his direct commitment to crusade, which there is with his father. Henry shows no intense devotion to uh, the, 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 the things like the, the, the friars observant uh, with, with their extraordinary prostrations and, 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 and extre you know, ex extreme literalism about the doctrines of poverty and all the rest of it. But we need to see Henry as a absolutely, for the first half of his reign, this absolutely conventional, totally conventional, serious, well-educated, well-informed, predisposed to moderate reform within the church, Catholic. Where does that fit, finally? Where does Marnie fit in all of this? Well, Marnie, I think, was very much part of, part of this, clearly was part of this world. It's very, very difficult to place him 
too precisely with, within almost most of it. Uh, we've got the evidence uh, that he is involved in some capacity uh, with the young, with the, in, in the, the household of Henry. I've no, I, as far as I'm aware, there, there is, is there evidence that he's actually there as Duke of York. I can't remember, but we've got the absolute certain evidence that as Prince of Wales, he's pro what office does he have? He's probably vice chamberlain of the prince's household. That's to say, effectively, it's administrative head. He's not the closest to the king, uh, uh, closest to the future king. That is the role that's fulfilled by Lord Mountjoy, um, uh, by, by, by William Blunt, Lord Mountjoy, uh, who is uh, the, his so-called socio studiorum, uh, his companion of studies, and so on. And, and literally, we've, we've got one set of royal accounts. We've been talking about uh, progresses and whatever. You can see him accompanying Henry, and as when Henry accompanies the court. You can see Mountjoy is always there with his bags and all the rest of it. Right. So again, uh, there is evidence that in the man who becomes the very closest to Henry uh, as king, personally, William Compton, had been a servant of, uh, of Henry Marnie. So that extraordinary relationship, again, begins within his following. Um, Marnie is influential enough that he is the person who p appears to persuade the young prince finally to acquiesce in the renunciation of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon in 1505. They'd been betrothed in 1504, and they'd semi-lived together. I don't mean they'd slept together, but they'd been under the same roof. They'd exchanged gifts. They'd played games of love. And I think Henry had thoroughly enjoyed it and remains in love with her, but he's bullied by his father with, 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 with Marnie's help. The relationship clearly remains an extraordinarily close one, and the test of it is what happens at Henry's accession. Only one important court office changes. We're ignoring the fact that Emerson and Dudley are swept out of the way. Only one important political office changes. That is the office of vice chamberlain and captain of the guard. Here again, can I give you an example? We've just had a succession of reigns, right? The key issue was who from the old queen's household will go and who from the new king's household will come in? That's, that's good. There are two rival households. You can't have both of them. And th that is the great test. And the remarkable thing that happens with Henry VII's, sorry, with Henry, Henry VII's death and Henry VIII's accession, there's a single change of post, and that is vice chamberlain. Henry VII's vice chamberlain, who'd only been appointed just over a year, and captain of the guard, who'd only been appointed just over a year, and who is at the heart of this process. Uh, Thomas Darcy um, is uh, a uh, passionate Catholic, uh, deep desire for crusade. He actually goes on sort of a couple. Um, he um, is... is um, uh, very closely, uh, very closely associated, uh, not as I think has been generally thought with Richard Fox, uh, but 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 uh, but actually uh, with with William Warham or Warham as Archbishop of Canterbury and so on. He is dismissed. He's given huge bribe. He's made a Knight of the Garter, uh, uh, Captain of Berwick, important posts uh, on the Scottish border, uh, uh, peerage, and all. You know, really, everything is thrown at him to get him out. And and in Darcy's place, you actually move Marnie as captain of the guard and vice chamberlain. But beyond that, I really don't know. All one can say is, clearly, Marnie fits both as a sense of warrior and particularly the sense of religious seriousness and so on into uh, this world as I've described it. I would also guess that his real function, this again is one of the vital things that happens across reigns, is what of the new is acceptable to the old, and what of the old is acceptable to the new? And I think Marnie is clearly the figure um, uh, amongst the adherents of the young prince, the household of the young prince, who is most familiar uh, with the older councillors, best known by them, and best trusted by them. And the great symbol of this fact is, of course, that Marnie uh, becomes the... Um, Money becomes uh, a, a, an executor, along with John Fisher of Lady Margaret Beaufort, and it again develops close relations with other figures that emerge uh, in this world of reformist, highly educated Catholicism, uh, people like Cuthbert Tunstall, uh, who becomes Bishop of London and Bishop of Durham, and is the great intellectual force behind, along with John Fisher, behind the anti-Lutheranism of this first part of Henry's reign. So, in order to, for us to understand the young Henry, we need to sever everything that happens after 1527. 
We've simply got to forget Anne Boleyn. We've got to forget five wives. All of that goes. We have to look instead from 50, his reign in one, in a fundamental sense, his reign begins in 1504. This is the moment at which suddenly even the people preaching sermons at court shift. This is the moment at which Collett and Fisher start to preach the great sermons at court. It's not Henry VIII's own accession. So we need to see this, this, first, this last reign of Henry VII and the first reign of Henry VIII as a kind of continuum with the very different sorts of policies that I've been outlining and a few figures like Marnie running across the two. Thank you very much.